Hi, welcome. I'm Tilly Strauss and I'm an artist from Northeast New York and um, it's a rural part just two hours north of the city. I've been a school teacher for 26 years and I'm the town clerk of, for my community, but um, I'm still learning and I'm really excited to share the fourth in this series of Who Is She that I've been researching and illustrating and I create a zine and now doing these um, talks with the Inspiration Arts Group International. I really want to say thank you to Bibiana and the group for sponsoring these talks because as I was saying, I'm very deadline driven and this is great. As I'm still learning, I would love any questions you have. I'm going to address them at the end if possible. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I think you have to sign in and use the chat um, to leave a question. But that would be really um, great. And so welcome, and we'll change the slide. Okay, so what started me on this series, I call it my 10 Shiro's from art history, is um, I wanted to address what was not in my education. I'm an art history, I have an art history degree, um, and yet I didn't learn about, I learned about only a handful of female artists. There's um, just so few, even on my bookshelf, there was only a small percentage were monographs on females. So I wanted that to change. And as I've started, I picked 10 artists that I really wanted to learn about. And in the process, of course, they're coming out of the woodwork. I find there's tons of female artists that have been going way back through time, everywhere and every time. They're, they're um, amazing. So I'm only doing 10 this year, but I would love any suggestions of other artists. I've been sort of collecting lists. Um, I was at a at a, um, a graduation ceremony this weekend, and Imani Perry, the author, spoke, and she said something about um, to find who we are, we have to locate the ancestral burial grounds, we have to dig for the bones, and we have to make the bones sing, and so that's kind of what I hope I'm doing when I'm digging up these female artists for a while. The last three artists were um, amazing women in their lifetime and yet um, sort of erased, literally pretty much erased upon their death from history, from everything. I find now I'm getting into a, a, a bunch of a few women now who were not famous during their lifetime, like Paula Moderson Becker. She was not. She worked pretty much in isolation and alone, um, but her influence on other artists, it was immense, and even on the her whole country, Germany. So, and that's really a, a, she's an artist. Artist, the other artists really love her, and um, and we just don't know about her. One thing about um, the last artist, Judith Leister, she um, they thought her career ended when she was thirty because she got married and she had to change her name. Um, and that's a whole nother thing I'll talk about. But here's a picture on the screen of Paula with her daughter. And really, motherhood did kill her. She had a very short life and died um, just within days after giving birth to her daughter, um, Matilda. Did you change this? So what's in a name? I'm going to call her Paula. And I know that that's kind of sounds, some people think that that's a little too informal when you're doing a biography of somebody. Um, but it's also political because, like I was saying about Judith Leister, once she married and became Frau Molinar, she was written out of history. Even though she continued to paint, there's no, you know, we're only now uncovering the paintings that she did. Paula, actually, she was Paula Becker. She was born Paula Becker. And um, she married Otto Moderson, and so she became Paula Moderson Becker. But the last year of her life um, before she died, she had left him and she wasn't sure what she wanted to be called. She wrote a letter to her friend and she said, I'm I'm no longer Paula Becker. I don't want to be Paula Moderson. I'm just me. Well, she'd only sold three paintings in her whole entire life. This is a self-portrait of her at, at that young age um, when she's like eight. 1899 or something. Anyway, she, her husband, she dies 
And the friends start talking about her work and collectors start coming in and buying her paintings by like the 20 or 30 paintings at a time. And so her husband, Otto Moderson, goes around and signs all of her pieces, PMB. And that's um, so that's been how she's been known from now on is Paula Moderson Becker. But I'm just going to call her Paula for for this talk because I, I think that's how she wanted it. So. OK. She's from Germany. She's a German artist. And um, actually on this map here, I don't know if you can see, but there's Dresden and Berlin over on the right side. And her, her father worked for the um, Berlin-Dresden Railway. And so they lived between those two places. And when Paula was about 12, they transferred him to Bremen, which is not only a, a city, but it's also a region. That's why that little gray space is it. So she was there when she was 12. When she was 15, she went to London and lived with an aunt. And um, this is a, a self-portrait that she drew around that time. She did about two months before she got really too homesick in art school, and she went back home. So she spends most of her life in that Bremen area. There's Warpsfeed. Warpsfeed is above Bremen. It's in the region of Bremen, and that's where an art colony is, and that's where she spends her adult years. She she goes to Berlin for um, governess training to be a governess. Her parents wanted her um, to have a skill that she could support herself with, and on the side, she takes art classes, and she attends this school in Berlin, which is the same one that my next artist, Kathy Kolwitz, she's, she's there at Berlin. So she's at the Warp Street at the Warp Street Colony after the governess school and a little bit of the art. And that's only 14 miles from where her parents live. So they were okay with it. They're like, okay. And it was very exciting for, for Paula to be there. But she does the, the city that she calls Mainstad, which is my city, is Paris. So she goes to Paris a couple times. And these are the times that are very informative about her artwork. Paris is in the, at the height of the Industrial Revolution. There's trains, there's elevators. The Eiffel Tower is, is risen up there. There's photography, telegraphs, the World's Fair, or it's the Exposition Universal. It has 28 countries participating. And even W.E.B. Du Bois has a booth there about the American Negro. So it's a very exciting time with all sorts of um, influences that come to her. Let me change the slide. So, but first the Vorps feed colony. So she has now um, graduated governess training and talked her parents into letting her come here. There's, um, it's a plain air landscape painting community. They are artists that all want to live together, work together. And the founders are um, Otto Morrison, and that's one of a drawing of him I did, and Fritz Mackinson. Um, now, Otto is one of the sort of teacher mentors and owners. His wife, um, he has a two-year-old daughter, and his wife has just died um, from that. So Paul and him get very close, but um, this is just something she's trying out. Can we change the slide? She also meets her girlfriend, Clara Westhoff. And... Um, Clara arrives there. She's at the same year and she's been studying art in Munich and she's from Brenham. So her parents are okay with her being just right there. Um, Fritz Mackinson talks her into becoming a sculptor and giving up her painting for a while. So she, and I love this. This is a painting of um, that Paula did of Clara, and then that's a sculpture Clara did of Paula. And I love the personality in it, the way she leans forward, her eyes all bright. It just totally, if when you read the story of Paula's life, she's just always out there. She's always ahead. She's always looking. She's she's curious. She's teaching herself. It's it's really exciting. So I love this, these two pieces they do. And then Paula's thing of Clara is very sort of a monumental, even though it's a small, it's on cardboard, a small painting. The way she's holding the flower, it's kind of a ritual, this ritual um, pose, timeless, um, the lighting on it. So this is something you'll see um, the way Paula will do um, people. Now, Clara is, gets married to Real, um, Rainier Maria Rilke, the poet, and it's a slightly a strained marriage because um, he's Catholic and uh, they, so they can never get a divorce. 
but they do live end up living separately. And later in in uh, Clara's life, she moves back to the area of Bremen to a town called Fischerhude, and her house is still there. And it's turned into a cafe, a cafe Rilke. So you can you can visit that. She also later in life in 1925, she took up painting again. She went back from sculpture to painting and had a very successful career as far as um, her sustaining her income. But the thing is that the work that she made was just sold right away into private collections. So there was no real critical um, analysis of it. And her 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 reputation kind of suffers because because of that, but she was able to support herself completely on her art, which is pretty cool. Um, yes. So in 1899, December 31st, the last night of the year, Clara and Paula take the midnight train to Paris and they, att they attend the Academy Colarossi, which is a, a uh, a studio that allows women to work from um, the model. And it's the owner of it is an Italian model himself. And so he runs this, this program at the Academy that both Claire and Paul are able to, to do. Um, she takes classes at the Col de Beaux-Arts. She attends lectures at the Sorbonne. She writes about um, visiting the Luxembourg Museum, which is where the, it's housing um, the living artists that will eventually their work, if it survives the test of time, ends up at the Louvre. She goes to El, Tro El Trocadero, which is another museum, which is more anthropological. And so it has um, artifacts from and artworks from all sorts of other countries around the world. She writes that um, in the afternoons at the Colorosi, she's able to draw from the nude and every half hour the the, the model takes a new position and how she just loves this. So this is a real freedom that she's not allowed in Germany. In Germany, they're still not letting women draw from the nude model. Another thing she sees there, are there these new galleries going up? And one is Ambrose Vollard's gallery. And while her and Claire are there, um, they see a show of Cezanne's work. And this is like a really shocking shocking way of painting. And so I put a sample of one of Cezanne's pieces there because you can see the the sort of the, the brushwork. He's not interested in the illusion of um, reality that a lot of the artists have been going for. And this is something that, that Paula will hold in her head as she goes back to Warp Speed. She'll, this, this idea of doing the essence of a work of art, of um, portraying a tree and the landscape, just the essentials of it and not necessarily like a, uh, photograph of it. So there's this kind of love triangle that goes on here between Westhoff, Rilke, and Rodin. Well, um, Westhoff works for Rodin, and I don't know if you know, but um, Rodin sleeps with everybody. So, so she does become his lover for a year, and um, she she meets Rilke. He's in the middle there um, at at Vorpsfeed. He's there, he's a poet. He's been in this long relationship with a, um, a Russian countess, a married woman for years and years and years and years. But he he falls in love with um, Clara. It's a little complicated. He gets a job with Rodin as Rodin's secretary. And he, um, Rilke and Paula become lifelong friends, but it's kind of different because he actually writes a book about the Vorpspeed colony and he never mentions her. And then when she comes to Paris this next time, he introduces her to Rodin and as Frau Modersen, wife of a distinguished painter. You know, so he he doesn't really take her seriously until the last year of her life. He's stunned by her work and um and he writes a piece um called Requiem for a Friend, which is about her. Um, so Clara's going to, um, Paula's going to return to Vorpspeed and rent lodgings from a farmer and Wilkie, um, Rilke and Westhoff are going to get married. So, so this is the lodging that the studio, um, it becomes, it's where, it's where Paula rented a room with this farmer and everything, but it's kind of, um, was easier to get married. Her and Otto are witnesses at 
the wedding. And of course, so she accepts his marriage proposal a month later. And he doesn't want her living in this cottage anymore, but he puts in these skylights. And I don't think these are the original skylights to like 1900, but that's where she had skylights. And that was where she rented and had a painting studio. And she would paint every day after breakfast and in the afternoons. And she wrote that just because I'm getting married, that's no reason not to become somebody. So she had an amazing ambition that just um, survived above and beyond the norms of the period. So um, when she marries, so she marries a month after um, her who two friends get married, it's unconsummated, which is kind of interesting. It's it remains unconsummated, and maybe it, the understanding is that Otto has issues. Maybe because his first wife died um, right after childbirth. I don't I don't know. But anyway, they don't go into that too much in letters. But but. Um, but Paula is pretty unhappy. She says she cries a lot during this time. She, they paint side by side a lot. And there's on the top piece is Otto's landscape painting, which is a kind of that romantic realism, every detail. And then below are a series of Paula's birch trees that she does. And basically her method, which reflects Cezanne and Gauguin, is trying to capture the essence of this. And she would said she would go out and she would draw the scenes. Then she would lie back in the grass and close her eyes until she could see the painting in her eyelids. And then she'd get up and paint it. So this is very different from the... Um, what was happening with the rest of the Vorp Speed colony artists. And it kind of, she was kind of on the outs with them a little bit. Okay. So in 1903, she goes back to Paris, which is also a deliberate move to prove that just being married doesn't mean she's going to change her ambition. At this time, she studies again at the French Academy. She stays six weeks, um, not as long as the first time, but Rilke and Westhoff are living there. So that's when she gets introduced to Rodin. She gets introduced to Picasso. And she's just amazed by the French artist's total lack of concern for convention, she says. you know, And she takes that with her. Like, why do we have to worry about other people understanding my art? I'm just going to do it myself. These are two self-portraits of her um, because that was the, the model that she could afford. And then the, the woman in the middle, which is a lot like, uh, the breastfeeding is a lot like um, the Van Gogh pieces with the, and with patterns and filling the frame. She spent a lot of time at the Egyptian wing at the Louvre um, and loved the encaustic mummy portraits um, in wax from the second century BC. So she'll start painting really thick in oil paint and use the, the stick end of her brush to, um, to scratch into the surface to kind of make it look like waxy. So... One of her favorite um, artists is um, Anna Schroeder. She was a woman who lived in the poorhouse and was willing to pose. She was also called Drabine, which means three legs because she had a cane with her and she was a dwarf and a hunchback. And um, Paula says she was looking for a timeless quality when she did these paintings. She was looking for the, the woman fitting into the landscape, an old lady. Um, and looking for biblical simplicity. It's definitely not what the warp speed artists are doing. They're all doing landscapes and suddenly she's, she's doing um, these pictures that are just old women. So, and children, she's doing children. She's getting them to pose and they're kind of in these, they're not like portraits of the children. They're ritualized poses. There's always something in the hand. They're holding a flower or they've got these hand gestures. If you Google, you know, Paula Motors and Becker children, you will see hundreds of paintings. She, she was very prolific. She was constantly working. And so it was very hard for me to just pick a few to show you. But another thing is from the Egyptian mummy portrait, she gets kind of that, those opaque eyes. So it's not like a, they're almost mask-like in a way. They're unsentimental. And that was something that was kind of shocking about her work, that she was doing children and old ladies and not in a romantic, sentimental way. She was just doing them as them. And in this sort of, um, anyway, change the slide, please. So 
she goes back to Paris. Okay. 1904. This is her third trip back um, out of four trips. And this time, you know, she's, she's begging Otto for money. He's not very happy about it. She doesn't have the money to paint. So she pretty much works with charcoal and she just draws Paris, you know, the streets, she draws the children. She also goes to the museum and will do tons of sketches of her, um, of other master paintings to study the composition. And she'll just redo the drawing is how she's working out her ideas of places. So this is, this was a very um, powerful time for her because when she goes back to warp speed, you can, she's actually taking on like, she's it's, see this sort of this outline, there's a black outline on everything that makes her colors sing. And this is probably from the charcoal and the color, but she starts doing, the, there's Drabin on the far left. And that's a stick with a big water bottle upside down on it. I thought it was a tree, but there, there's a bunch of, she had these all over her house, apparently these empty bottles, bottle trees. Um, so she does Drabin holding a flower. And then she does her self-portrait in the middle. And that is the first self, first nude self-portrait um, that an artist has done in the Western canon. Picasso sees this and actually does one um, after one of his rare nudes is after he had seen this piece. Um, she also does a lot of um, setups where the, the children are, or the, the model is on a little platform. You can see on the one on the far left right there's like a space underneath her um like an altarish or something and a goldfish bowl she does a lot of paintings with these goldfish in this goblet which you will also see in matisse's work later and this was they they were in paris when she was in paris doing those those drawings she was attending all these the, she was attending salons and going to galleries and she was studying and mixing and people it wasn't that she showed her art too much because she was pretty much in isolation but they did see her work and so there was um interest in what she was doing so these are some pieces she goes back to warp speed and she continues doing these nude children portraits that are kind of and simple items next to it almost as if there's an offering or something going on and they're holding plants well, her husband gets a little alarmed. Um, he actually writes that he's worried that they're chunky and distorted. They're ugly. They're bizarre. They're wooden. Their faces are like cretins. They're a revolting mix of colors. She's, he doesn't understand, he says, why she's painting sick children, degenerates, and the dregs of humanity. So you can kind of maybe understand that the marriage isn't going so great. So at, when she turns 30, she sneaks away in the middle of the night and gets back to Paris in 1906. And this time she decides she's leaving her husband. And this is when she says she doesn't know how to sign her name. I am me. Um, I am just me. She's intensely happy. Her family writes her and tells her, you have to go back. She says, don't interfere with me, mother. You know, this is where I need to be. The painting in the middle is the view out her studio um, window in onto the Paris scenes. You can see she continues with these models and she's doing these nude breastfeeding. And nobody, I, I don't think, the first time I saw anything like this was like with Alice Neal. And I thought, wow, Alice Neal is doing something incredibly new. But this was in 1906. And she's doing these images that are very powerful and nudes and and kind of mysterious so i you know go to, there's go to the next slide uh, thank you um she does run into picasso and this guy bernard hoitger and this is the painting on the far left is a portrait of his wife lee hoitger and bernard is a sculptor and an architect and they're meeting at one of these salons at the steins which is in the lower right um, the Stein family, the part, the studio she has is just catty corner from where Leo and Gertrude, um, their brother and sister, have both rented um, houses or own their houses. I don't know, actually. And they but they have their salons and they have their art collections and they open it up for artists to stop stop in. So Paula meets Bernard there and he convinces her to show him 
her his work and he's amazed and he gives her lots of encouragement now at this point paula had only been in one show and it was um early when she had the Drabine paintings and it was with the warp speed artists and a critic said something the first night and she pulled her work from the show so she hasn't had any shows and um when she dies she's only sold three paintings in her life but he gives her a lot of encouragement and it actually, and he promotes her work and he sees it as groundbreaking and you'll see she just like, she flourishes. She paints like 80 paintings in one year. Now, Picasso, who'd been struggling with his portrait in the middle there is Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein. He'd been struggling with the head of it and he'd gone to Spain, um, left it undone and sort of a hint of a profile. And when he comes back, he and Hoytger and the Steins and Paula, he sees what she's done with Lee's painting that's at, at um, Bernard's house. And you can see there's x-rays of this painting as he's moves, he moves the head around until it's in the exact position. Um, so there's a lot of belief that, and it's not just me, a lot of belief that um, he took the pose and the head, the head position from Paula Moderson Becker. So it was just, but that's normal. Artists are stealing all the time from each other. And that's what she loved so much about Paris. So these are some of the paintings she makes. She does just, and it's you, nobody in 1900, no women artists are painting themselves naked like this. And also she's not painting herself as a Venus. She's not painting herself as um, a, a virgin. You know, this is just women as women. The one on the far left is her self-portrait pregnant, and she's not pregnant, but pregnant with possibilities. We don't know what she was thinking there, but that is definitely her. And by all the dates, she was not pregnant at that time. Um, the one in the middle are comes from photographs. We have um, examples of photographs she posed for the camera herself in these positions and then painted from the, from the pictures. And... Um, the same with the, the mother and child on the far right, each holding a fruit. There's something about fruitfulness. And that was her, her, her theme for this year of living finally free. She was going to be somebody. And um, this is Rilke visits her and he's just blown away by her extraordinary development and her relentless painting and her purposefulness. So he's, um, he's pretty amazed about it. Yeah. She paints these incredible paintings of a mother and child sleeping or breastfeeding together, laying down, and they're massive. And um, Otto shows up, her husband. He's been trying to write her. She needs some money, but she doesn't want to. She's, she's now done about 80 paintings. She goes to consult a lawyer. We know that. She needs money. Otto's like wants to save the marriage. So he moves to Paris and they consummate the marriage finally. And guess what happens? She gets pregnant. So, so her, she writes her mother in March that she's um, pregnant and they have to go back to Vorpsfeed, which is the right place to be. Um, this is her last painting. And I think it's just kind of interesting. The it's kind of the figure seems to me timid, to totally clothed. She'd been doing all these nudes, and here you have her in a little red dress, and she's got like the the sunflower on her head is kind of the petals are crushing down on her. So she's she's kind of in in this place. It seems with um, trepidation she's returning to Vorpsfeed. The photo on the right is her and Otto and Otto's daughter, her step her stepchild Elsbeth. Um, so, and and there she's pregnant, and that's one of the last pictures before she has her baby. Um, what is very powerful about about Paula is that she painted women and children and old ladies, the, the, the whole, all the milestones of the ages of women without any real sentimentality. He painted them as real human beings, not through the lens of a man. They were people with their own, you know, thoughts and, and whatever they stood for. And that was very, very radical. She also had like, um, 
strange uses of color. Like you can see the arms and the face. She just did what, what she wanted to do. And it was very much, she was concerned about the emotion of things. So basically I just want to leave you with this, that she's um, uncompromising. She brought the post-impressionist, all the post-impressionist ideas to Germany, the, from Cezanne to Van Gogh to Gauguin to Picasso. Um, she, she was coming back and forth to this art colony and showing what she had. She dies while holding her daughter um, at 18 days after. She had a horrible um, childbirth. Um, there were forceps and chloroform and she complained about pain in her legs. So the doctor said, just lay down um, and stay in bed for a couple weeks. And so when she stood up and got her hair braided and she went over and held um, Matilda, her last word was shad. What a pity. And, um, and she died right then. So basically in Germany, she's very, popular that she's been on these stamps they they sell postcards and magnets of her everywhere children learn about her in school um but she's just not known much outside of germany while she was alive she only sold three paintings but friends spread the word collectors came i told you the husband signed everything i was going to say that she hadn't had a show a major show in paris since then but my uncle who lives in france corrected me likely before I, before tonight. And he said that he'd been to a show and it was actually, um, in 2016, 110 years after her last trip to Paris, the, um, they had a show of her work at the modern art museum in the Ville de Paris. So that was pretty cool, but it's taken a while. Um, I wanted to say that there was an art collector that who loved her work and collected a lot of it, Ludwig Roselius. And he actually um, was the inventor of decaffeinated coffee, just to say on the side. His father died young. He, his father had a coffee factory and died young at 59. And when he heard the, overheard the doctor saying it's because he had too much caffeine, he made it his life's mission to invent decaf coffee. So I did a little drawing of him there. And he decided to open a museum to Paula just for focusing on her work. She's the first woman in Western art to have her own museum. And he invited, of all people, Bernard Hutger, who we met, who is a close friend of, of Paula's in Paris, to build this museum. And it's a very expressionist museum. You can see um, pictures of it. I have a black and white and a brick one. It's a very narrow alley in front, so I think it's hard to get a full picture of it. But it opened in 1927. And um, and it survived the war, to tell you the truth, because um, Hitler uses the same words that Otto did about um, her paintings and decides and includes her in 1937 in his degenerate art show, which only goes to prove that within just a couple decades after she died, she was that famous and well known that Hitler had to, you know, put her down. She, so she may have worked in isolation during her life. But the effects of her work reverberated and were very powerful in, um, in the art world and with the other artists and effective. So she's erased in a different sort of way. Um, but I think I was really excited to learn about her. And, um, and just, it's a very, sh very, very short life. And, but she had hundreds and hundreds of, of paintings. Um, I think she had 700 paintings and thousands of drawings when, when she died. So, so anyway, that's what I've got on her. I just wanted to say that I have a zine coming out. It isn't back from the pre printers yet, but it'll be here on Friday that goes more in, in depth about her life and the times and all that. It's 20 pages. Thank you for your time on all this. And next month, I'm going to be talking about Kathy Colwitz, who is not at all uh, an erased artist, but I believe there's parts of her art um, collection and practice that we don't know about. And I'm curious more about her, the way she depicted motherhood and loss um, and, and the plight of the, of the poor and the working class. So I think 
Yes, Phyllis, her, I got a question here. Did her daughter live? Her daughter is actually manager, was or managed the collection at that museum with um, Ludwig Roselius. He got, when she got of age, she's the manager of that collection. And there's a couple museums in Germany that feature a lot of her work. Um, and so it's very exciting. But this is on my, on my dream list now. I want to go over to that museum and see it. So thank you. Any any other questions or anything? You can write them in. Yeah, most of her paintings do survive today, even though a lot of them were on um, cardboard. She painted on cardboard. Um, but there's they were because she hadn't sold any, like Van Gogh hadn't sold any. Um, they were able to be managed, and you know, her husband signed his name on all of them, so they're all together and they can they sort of show the progression of what she's done really nicely. I don't know how many are actually in that museum, but I heard about another museum in Germany that has a whole bunch, so there's usually big collections. But her, her, one of her. Um, last self portraits that she did, and I is at the Museum of Modern Art. I came across it just the other day. Ah, anyway, this is this is, and they had a book there about it, just about that one painting, which is really cool. Um, her self portrait, and it's her self portrait pregnant. She has her hand at the very bottom of the, of the painting. She's got her hand across her the top of her belly, and it. So it was her last portrait she painted of herself. But I love, look at how she does this. Like, where's the neck? Um, the, the, it's just, it's emotional color. It's whatever, you know, on her brushwork and the, yeah. Anyway, I you should go see it. You can find her work. Um, in the zine, I have the whole list of where you can find her, a lot of her works. But of course, Bremen would be the place to go for the, the museum about her. So Okay, thank you. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Chrissy. I had a question. Yeah. It was great, by the way. So her husband, Otto, what did he do? Because you, you kept saying she needed money. Like, was he wealthy? Did he work? What was he? Yeah, he was he was a painter. And he ran the, you know, he ran the Warp, Warp Speed art colony. Oh, and, okay. And he had some money. But I don't think he had a lot of money. But I think he was he was very generous with her in the beginning, you know, and it must have gotten frustrated for him at the end. But yeah. And and you know, I didn't tell you earlier that her daughter's name was Matilda. Yeah. So mm, yeah. So thank you. I'm glad to see you, Deborah and Chrissy. Thank you, thank you for thank your support. You. Thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll see you next month for yeah. Kathy Colwitz. All right. All right. Good work. Thank you. Bye. Okay. I think we're still, yeah, this is the, the code for getting to the YouTube video. If you look at it with your phone, it's really good. Mm. Okay. Well, I know where